Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I think all of you have enjoyed yesterday's meeting and got much information. Thank you for attending this sub -theme. In this sub -theme, we will have seven important presentations. In order to save, uh, save time, I will not introduce the seven speakers together. So, firstly, let's invite Tom God from the Agriculture and Forestry Ministry in Alberta, Canada, to give the first keynote speech. Due to the time difference, Tom cannot give presentation, but he has submitted his video. Please uh, show his video. Testing one, two, three. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whichever part of the world you're joining us today. My name is Tom Goddard. I will be leading off uh, theme three here with the, the long title. Shorten the title to something uh, simpler. It's Structure, Governance, and Policy Support for CA. I'd like to acknowledge my co-contributors, Amir Kassam and Glennis Fry as well as the other people listed here that have contributed in, in uh, encouraging me and materials for policy and institutional support at different scales around the world. So today I'm going to uh, start and, and it'll be a three part uh, presentation. The first part is going to be the big picture, the global uh, macro forces that we see uh, in sort of five areas, then I will distill that down to what is important for agriculture, what I see happening there. And then the key part is conservation agriculture and uh, the implementation issues around uh, governance structure policy there and opportunities that we can all take in that area. So the big picture, Steve, is um, in the first one here is society. We're seeing uneven growth. Uh, urbanization is increasing. I think it's 33 cities in the world now are uh, more than 10 million in population, and we're going to see that grow to 43, I believe, um, cities by 2030. So a huge uh, increase there. The rural areas are moving into the cities where other jobs are there. Uh, cities are getting larger. Um, the urban-rural divide is getting wider and deeper. We're seeing um, population growth uneven in the, in the world as well. It's uh, moving more or growing more rather in developing economies and less so in the developed world is sort of plateauing out there. Pandemic has, has seen uh, some movement of people, rural to urban, urban to rural again and uh, telecommuting happening from, from home. People are getting very familiar with technology. Technology is all about digitization, data and connectivity. We are seeing exponential growth in the technology itself. We're seeing a rapid reduction in the price or that price performance ratio is changing. Uh, the companies are growing exponentially as well. And knowledge along with that for everyone uh, in the industry and affected by the industry is growing. We can now do the unimagined. We can position ourselves on, on farms uh, according to GPS and, and what that means to us. Uh, smartphones, cell phones becoming ubiquitous, the important tool for farmers now. Connectivity, farmers can now connect to other farmers in a region, in a nation, and around the world, and also to experts. Never had that before. Uh, so it's exciting times. It, the technology allows us to measure and monitor things that we didn't before. It's fostering systems thinking, which is congruent with um, conservation agriculture. Robotics automation, all of that is uh, uh, the enabling features of technology. Economics, uh, we're seeing disruptions, we're seeing systems approaches uh, or thinking, and we're seeing the surplus and deficit uh, conundrum and budgets now in the, in the pandemic world or post-pandemic era. The Trade disruptions, we're seeing uh, WTO, is, as some economists have said, on life support. Uh, we're seeing bilateral and multilateral meetings taking the place. We're seeing 
industry meetings like uh, World Economic Forum and, and Food Summit uh, taking the place and, and becoming almost trade or side trade negotiations going on there. Uh, we're seeing a systems view of circular economy, less waste of industry and society, new products coming out. Uh, GDP or gross domestic product is no longer enough of an economic metric uh, for many countries and we're moving into appreciation of nature and human well-being. Uh, so everything from happiness index to natural capital is becoming a metric uh, yardstick to to judge success by for, for various countries. Uh, the pandemic has seen sensitivity and resilience in supply chains, including the ag food chain, as well as the issues of uh, temporary labor sources uh, in all industries, including agriculture. So we're, we're conscious, very sensitive about this whole supply chain uh, in agriculture. Environment is uh, many priorities. Um, and increasing concerns and the public as a whole is increasingly public aware rather of uh, environment issues and supportive of them. Uh, the big elephants in the room I call them like climate change and convention of biodiversity are all there. Uh, there's tension amongst countries that we have to do something. These uh, national uh, determined uh, uh, contributions of uh, change in practice or development is there, they're generally kind of weak. So uh, countries are looking for more things to do. CA, I think, can step in and help here. Uh, environment also is all about responsible consumption, less waste, um, sustainability, uh, the uh, environment social governance reporting. So again, even within companies, they're like moving beyond the, the pure economic metrics into other uh, metrics and, and reporting and labeling with those. Political legal components, uh, we're seeing a lot of populism, polarity, negotiation, and the recovery of the, the post-pandemic era. Uh, the populism is um, favoring farmers and environment. They're not usually the targets, it's other topics in society that are the targets. Uh, Multi-party governments are I have increased uh, burden of negotiation because of the po polarization of issues around them. Uh, it's this us versus them on everything, uh, any topic you want. It's it's polarized uh, very advocacy, advocacy groups. Um, the international conventions abound. They're, they're there. Their uh, countries have to uh, abide by them. They're, they're meeting with them on a regular basis. Uh, I see a lot of countries are still focused on the two simple sort of policy tools, carrot and stick uh, policies, incentives and regulations. We need to move beyond that and become more uh, innovative uh, in, in developing policies. The other concern is, has the pandemic hardwired some political governance uh, oversight and authority? Um, a lot of governments had to move quickly and move forward, move assertively in certain areas and uh, kind of cut the corners, create new rules. Uh, after the pandemic, are governments going to revert back to the pre-pandemic uh, situation or is there going to be some precedents here? That will be interesting to see how that evolves. The agriculture foresight in this area is um, uh, large farms are getting larger, population changes. Uh, the less dense rural population uh, is going to happen as these farms get larger. In some areas, the small farms are getting smaller and more numerous. So maybe in some of these areas, the uh, rural population isn't lessening. Uh, family size is often uh, smaller in some cases. Um, the and all farms are expanding into less productive landscapes, more vulnerable uh, landscapes. And at the same time, because all the good land was taken up by the, the early uh, farmers or farm production areas. And society is um, pressuring against this expansion. They don't want to see more natural landscapes taken up by anybody, including agriculture. Um, Internet infrastructure is lagging in agriculture. 
uh, the connectivity and the bandwidth and that sort of thing. But at the same time, agriculture is benefiting from the technologies and equipment and applications and systems and tracking of commodities to preferential markets. Um, the public, uh, non-government organizations, corporations, everybody is sensitive to the environment now. Then, as well as food safety, exploitation of people, assurance of food, assurance of markets, and expectations are on agriculture to also be more conscious in all of these areas. Conservation agriculture now. We are, well, I'll start just a, a quick overview of some of these adoption incentives. So the keep in mind that there's uh, public and private good to adopting farm practices and, and conservation agriculture. It's all about sort of the economics and the well-being of the farm. Uh, the farmer is looking at the long-term view, sustainability, better profit margins in their uh, more resilient uh, commodity production over time with uh, resistance to droughts and pests and things like that. So we know that, uh, but conservation agriculture is special in that there's a lot of public goods that comes along with that. And public goods are uh, concerns to um, society, government, and industry, everybody else. Uh, ecosystem services increase. Uh, CA is well aligned to the international convention, as well as aligned to new policy needs of nations on environment, industrial growth, re uh, research and development, health. Uh, conservation agriculture can apply to all of these. Implementation incentives and support and, and specifics here. Uh, number one is equipment. We've uh, come a long way with equipment and uh, getting equipment available. Uh, there is still financial barriers in many countries, many farmers, uh, both financial barriers and knowledge barriers of how to use this equipment. So we're seeing a, a big boom in third-party service providers. FAO themselves have a sustainable ag mechanization initiative, uh, which includes training uh, outline materials for service providers. We need catalogs of no-till and CA equipment. There's bits and pieces here and there, but there's no sort of uh, comprehensive catalog or decision tree to help farmers uh, decide that. Some of the policies that have worked in the past is sharing agreements uh, of equipment where farmers will share with other farmers of equipment along with that uh, is that implicit knowledge of uh, transfer when the equipment is shared. There's been successful programs on rebates of, of equipment or partial um, to overcome that financial barrier again. Uh, we need to supply researchers and demonstration farms with equipment, proper equipment, so they can do a proper job. We've seen a lot of researchers struggling with equipment and thus not really having relevant results come out, uh, but nevertheless, they're published. Uh, we also need to incent the development of equipment manufacturers um, to move in that conservation agriculture area. And there, again, there's various tools in that. Uh, suite that we can use for that. A uh, couple of websites, one for the FAO and another one from Agri uh, for Africa, uh, website that has a lot of equipment uh, manufacturers uh, displaying their, their, their wares there. So again, a nice sort of uh, pseudo catalog and information source for farmers. Seeds, uh, another area uh, for implementation, uh, both from a rotations, the, the intended crop and rotation and cover crops or catch crops. The, we have a catch 22 scenario there. You won't grow a new crop if you don't have a market. If you have a mark, you can't have a market without the, the crop there. So uh, we need stock, seed stock for demonstrations and applied research to show the potential to build new markets. Uh, we need to support that distribution industry of seed suppliers and market development. Key component here is, is sort of that knowledge research uh, continuum. Uh, knowledge and the systems approach or systems thinking approach needs to prevail. Uh, governments need to support extension service. I've seen no end of books, papers, conferences where it comes down to extension is needed. Not necessarily the old extension, it could be the new style extension. Um, some things that I've seen is, is uh, specific to like no-till or CA, a web-based farmer equipment directory where 
It's a private directory. You register, you get in. You can find farmers that are using the equipment that you want to buy or farming the soil types or crops that you want to, uh, that you're working with, and you can get good information. So it's sort of a, an extension uh, meeting place. Uh, there's also, a, a, I know of a situation here where we have a, a week, every week, uh, a Twitter uh, forum for one hour, Wednesday mornings, uh, where entomologists are on hand to answer all the questions from farmers across the whole region. Uh, farmers can send in pictures of bugs, can ask questions, can look for recommendations, sources of information. All of that happens on Twitter and condensed into one period every week, every week during the growing season. Uh, there's also ag consultants uh, in their websites where now you can go onto a website, you can see profiles of ag consultants, what their, pro what their uh, characteristics expertise is and access them on a fee for service, whether it's an hour or a week. You can trade again, pictures, data, uh, all that sort of thing. So it's a consultant, virtual consultant, I guess. Um, the research and other institutions need support uh, or um, initiatives from government. Uh, they need to reward innovation. We need to look at a paradigm shift to these research institutions. Um, we've been doing it the same way. It's the same structure for the last 100 years. You need to sort of step out and, and discover new ways of doing things, new um, uh, reward systems, new um, uh, ways of dealing with employees and how we do research. Remember, conservation agriculture has a large public good component in it. So who pays for that public good research? It has to be governments or the public, uh, the private entities, the, the input suppliers or seed suppliers, they will fund that private good research, but uh, we need to be looking at that public good as well. Everyone, farmers, researchers, uh, and everybody in between need to be developing their own policy briefs to get information up to the policy makers or influencers of policy makers. You need to tell your story, show the science. Here's a few quotes I, I've uh, collected. Uh, one out of the US was in response to some university scientists publishing research on how tail got low yields and they came up with uh, a lot of reasons uh, why growers themselves have higher yields than university scientists and research bots and again it's not one reason it's many reasons uh, another researcher is looking at land policies and, and what's been happening in a number of different countries said that there's little evidence that scientific results have affected these policies so we need to get that science in front of them uh, in the science um, journal a, a few years ago, uh, there's an article on the do's and don'ts for scientists who want to shape policy. So again, we, we need to all train ourselves in this. Um, but we need that, that diversity or mixture of people. As Nelson Mandela had said, he said uh, he's looking for friends with independent minds because they make you see problems from all angles. So we have to look at the issues from all angles and outside the box. Very often we get stuck inside the box. Certification and metrics. Uh, these are retail driven. They've been around for a bit. It is a growth area as well as the conventional international food companies. We're now seeing the emergence of other industries. Uh, some of the big tech companies have been the bigger, biggest buyers of, of carbon credits lately. Uh, banks are also in this business now in the service industry. So it's uh, an exciting growing area. Met the metrics that we're looking at, it used to be simple, carbon or water, and then it became more complex with environmental footprints. Uh, even and, and then we also look at the boundaries. FAO uh, authors uh, recently did a paper showing if we expand the boundaries to all the pre-production, your inputs of, of production, as well as your post-production food processing, uh, we can be looking at uh, global GHG contribution from agriculture doubling. Um, we're looking at, at more valuable or more efficiency oriented coefficients. So it's, it's production per unit area, it's uh, protein per unit production, uh, that type of thing. So becoming more meaningful, perhaps more measurable, more important. Uh, 
uh, a recent one that is out now uh, on the metrics or asking for metrics is nations are now talking about carbon border adjustment mechanisms. This is basically a carbon tariff on uh, commodities moved from one country to another based on their carbon footprint of production. Funding, we need to be looking at a variety of options here and developing them for, for conservation agriculture. Green bonds uh, can uh, play a role. They're often looking at a practice change or equipment or monitoring. CA can benefit from all of this. And CA can bring to the table the multifunctionality of agriculture and the multiple benefits of CA. So the promise is there. You can do checkoffs at a national commodity level. So um, so much per ton of commodity produced goes back into a pool. Uh, there's opportunities here for farmers to be directing how that pool is spent and to, um, again, independent minds at the table uh, looking at, at issues. Um, surcharges, you can look at surcharges on inputs like, uh, and, and, and a very small amount, we're not looking at, at uh, competitive disadvantages here, but a small amount of surcharge on a ton of fertilizer or, or volume of pesticide or something like that can uh, generate some income that can go back into promoting CA or equipment uh, developments or something like that. Um, we can also have carbon taxation. There's a lot of countries looking at carbon taxation um, across the board. Opportunities there. Offset payments uh, for ecosystems as well. Political governance. Uh, we're looking at um, integrated policy needs uh, uh, across the, the world and, and across nations. Uh, we need to be conscious that agriculture is human-centered centered policy for farmers and consumers, where some of these other conventions are more economic-centered policies. There's an opportunity for advisory panels here, uh, for CA uh, uh, groups or advisory panels to ministers of agriculture, to other people. This brings farmers and others together. It's integrating the science, the thinking, uh, documenting what these trade-offs are being. Uh, we need uh, R&D directions and priorities, and that can be directed by uh, reporting on results that are there, auditing uh, what's being done and what's not being done, identify those gaps. Just like to end with, again, I've given you a lot. I haven't put it all together because how that puts together becomes specific to your circumstances, where you're at uh, in the continuum of, of uh, mainstreaming CA, working with your policymakers. But the opportunities are all there and all aligned. How they align and which way is up to you, but they are, they're easy to align, I <laughs> should say easy. Um, and you need to harness the local effects of all these mega trends that I've been talking about. We need to look at policy and government and governance in the future. And the past should not be carried all the way into the future. We need to be thinking out of the box. We need to be looking at integrative policies, new policy tools, uh, dynamic policies, uh, adaptive policies, that sort of thing. Uh, and question the structures that, that we've had, the institutions. Uh, CA is aligned with all the international and the national policy and development needs. So it is a nice sort of perfect fit or the glue between the uh, pieces of paper, the mortar between the bricks uh, to build a, a solid future, solid uh, policy future for, for nations and, and the world. Um, let's pay attention to the, the presentations following mine and see what uh, they have. I think you'll see a lot of uh, good ideas come out of this. We live in exciting times. We just need to coordinate, uh, reach around the world via internet and all the wonderful tools that we have. And uh, we can definitely make a difference. Just now, Ms. Tom introduced the, the structure, governance and the policy support of CA. Especially the development of CA is affected by social, 
technological, economic, environment, political, and legal aspect. In, in addition, it pro provides suggestions for CA promotion. I hope Tom can come here uh, to answer his question. Thanks to Tom. Now, our second speaker is, uh, should be Yang Shitang from University of Queensland. Um, but now she cannot uh, be here. Please show his uh, video. Thank you. Okay, so good morning everyone. My name is Catherine Page and I'm from the University of Queensland um, in Australia. And today I'm going to be presenting a talk on no-till systems in conservation agriculture and their challenges and opportunities. So this presentation was prepared by Yash Dang, also from the University of Queensland. However, unfortunately he has been unwell, so today I'm going to be presenting on his behalf. Okay, so there's been extensive research, development and extension activity that has been conducted to refine and promote no-till systems in recent decades. And this has led to the adoption of no-till on more than 180 million hectares of land worldwide, which represents 12.5% of global crop lands. So no-till has offered um, a clear path towards sustainability and we've seen reduced erosion, improved water quality, <clears throat> increased soil organic carbon, particularly in the surface of the soil profile, improvements in microbial activities, and ultimately increases in grain yield, particularly in dry climates where rain-fed agriculture is practised. However, despite these benefits, the long-term sustainability of no-till farming systems has been questioned. Um, no system is perfect, and no-till farming is certainly not an exception to this. So today I'm going to discuss some of the challenges of no-till systems and opportunities to address these to increase no-till adoption worldwide. Okay, so one of the major challenges with no-till systems has been a build-up of grassy weeds that are hard to kill and the development of herbicide resistance, um, which increases the challenges associated with weed control. Um, there's also been a build-up of soil and stubble-borne diseases such as crown rot under no-till systems. Soil insect pests with the low ground pupil stages can be difficult to control without tillage. There can be vertical stratification of the mobile nutrients in the surface of the soil profile, which can affect plant nutrient availability. In some uh, regions, there can be decreased nitrogen availability due to decreased rates of mineralization or greater nitrogen immobilization with uh, an absence of tillage and stubble retention. And soil temperatures in no-till systems are generally lower due to higher soil water contents and greater stubble retention. And while this can be an advantage in hot climates, in cooler regions it can restrict soil warming um, and plant establishment with ultimate uh, negative impacts on yield. And in addition, in areas where low yields are the norm, it can be difficult to maintain sufficient residue cover to prevent erosion, soil compaction, suppress weeds, um, which can undermine the overall um, effectiveness of the no-till system. <clears throat> so many studies report that there are net increases in production and significant economic benefits associated with the use of no-till. Um, however, there are a number of economic and social barriers to its success. So in some instances, there can be higher input costs, particularly during the adoption stage, which for farmers with low levels of liquidity can be a significant um, disincentive to the uptake of no-till. Lack of access to seeds, suitable markets, transportation facilities, or suitable storage facilities can also limit the use of diverse crop rotations, which can be critical to the success of no-till systems. Um, in mixed crop livestock systems, there can be significant opportunity costs involved in the introduction of no-till, mainly due to the inability to use stock, um, the residues of stock feed or to bale residues for sale to other producers. There can be an initial net decline in income before the yield benefits of no-till materialise. And in many farming communities, the principles of no-till systems run counter to established land management traditions that have worked for generations and which have often created cultural values and rural traditions. So overcoming the mindset in farming communities that tillage is required for successful ag agricultural reduction uh, can be a challenge in many regions. There are also a number of environmental barriers to the success of no-till systems. Um, while the advantages of no-till for reducing erosion and runoff are often well established, um, there can be a general perception that chemical use is higher under no-till and there is general community concern 
uh, regarding the potential detrimental effects of this for both environmental and human health. Increases in infiltration that commonly, commonly lead to greater soil water storage in no-till systems can also lead to increased rates of profile leaching. And this can potentially lead to increased movement of water, salt and nutrients um, out of soil profiles into groundwater. And in poorly drained soils, increases in nitrous oxide production can also be observed. Um, and this can negate the positive effects of increased carbon sequestration and decreased fuel usage. Um, and may even lead to net increases in global warming potential um, at some sites. So to deal with some of the agronomic challenges of no-till, many growers are shifting towards a more flexible approach to tillage management by using one-off tillage events within the otherwise no-till system. Um, and this is often referred to as occasional strategic tillage. However, many growers are concerned about the pros and cons of such a flexible approach on soil health um, and research into whether occasional strategic tillage will undo some or all of the benefits of long-term no-till is in its infancy. <clears throat> This diagram provides a summary of some of the impacts of strategic tillage that we have observed from one-time um, events within long-term no-till systems in northeastern Australia. Um, and from this, you can see that uh, any negative impacts of strategic tillage, as um, indicated by the red shading here, um, tend to be short-lived with positive or more neutral impacts observed over the longer term. Um, however, it's unclear if it's possible to use strategic tillage to fully manage soil constraints or whether a return to a system with a higher frequency of tillage will be required. Um, also, these impacts um, require further testing in a range of soils and agroclimatic regions. Um, overall yields the ultimate indicator of cropping system performance. And it's clear that no-till systems do have potential to improve many aspects of soil health and environmental quality compared to conventional tillage. Um, and in some cases, strategic tillage may be an effective tool to help manage some of the biotic and abiotic challenges that negatively impact yield um, within a no-till system. Um, so due to the diversity of farmers and farming communities worldwide, no-till systems cannot be implemented with a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, they require site-specific adaptation to local conditions that's often best identified through on-farm participatory research. So as part of this research, it's important to identify um, locally appropriate crops and crop rotations to best manage soil fertility and weeds, pests and diseases. Um, the identification of locally appropriate seeding and harvesting equipment is also essential. Um, as we just talked about, a flexible approach to tillage may be required. Um, however, good quality local research is needed to identify when and how to integrate strategic tillage into no-till systems. Integrated approaches are essential to manage pests, weeds and disease problems. And soil constraints such as compaction or low soil fertility must be treated before the implementation of no-till. Um, in addition, it's vital that we pay attention to the socioeconomic factors that can uh, increase or decrease no-till adoption. So to increase um, no-till adoption, one effective approach is to develop better partnerships between farmers, researchers, policy makers and the private sector to ensure that farmers have access to the equipment, market and knowledge that they need to make uh, no-till systems successful in their particular region. They can also include policy, uh, policy initiatives to subsidise or incentivise no-till, uh, for example, by increasing access to credit or farm machinery required for no-till. Um, this is particularly important for farmers who have liquidity constraints, when yield increases are slow to develop, and when the farmer is learning the best way to practice no-till for their particular circumstance. Um, and effective extension services are vital to facilitate knowledge dissemination um, and are often positively correlated with no-till uptake. Extension efforts that are tailored to in individual audiences and that provide continuing support over time to help manage the challenges of no-tools uh, the no-till system are also more likely to meet with success. Okay, so today I've just briefly outlined the challenges and opportunities for no-till farming systems. Um, however, for those in the audience who would like to read a more comprehensive treatment of the issue, Yash Dang, Ram Dalal and Neil Menzies from the University of Queensland have recently edited a book on the issue. Um, this book provides a comprehensive outline of the agronomic, soil, economic and environmental challenges and opportunities associated with no-till and it provides case studies and regional examples to highlight these issues in various climatic and geopolitical regions worldwide. 
Um, the publication is available to, through Springer Nature, and we would encourage you to, um, yeah, check, check it out. Okay, so thank you very much for listening today, um, and I will hand you back to Yash, um, who is hopefully now well enough to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ms. Yash uh, just introduced the CS Challenge and Opportunity in Australia. Also, a new book on local farming system is introduced. Thank you, Yash Gang. The third presentation is by Kaki Tika from National Agronomy Research Center, Nepal. Uh, please show his video. Namaste and greetings from the country of Mount Everest, Nepal. Chairperson of the organizing committee and the participants of the Earth World uh, Conservation Agriculture Conference being held in Bern, Switzerland. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, initiatives and experience, experiences of conservation agriculture in Nepal is, is my topic to deliver today. And uh, I have uh, mainly divided my presentation into three major topics that is conservation agriculture and its works done so far in Nepal and uh, some of the constraints of uh, CA promotion in Nepal and a uh, uh, few initiatives that, that has been taken and to be taken uh, for the promotion of conservation agriculture in Nepal. So far, conservation agriculture works done in Nepal is concerned, um, despite the many significance and uh, widely adopted in the uh, across the globe. But its pace is quite slow in Nepal, and uh, uh, very few initiatives has been taken. And in this regard, Nepal Agriculture Research Council started to work on conservation agriculture and rice-based cropping system during 1990s in collaboration with Rice Wheat Consortium. Uh, some of the CABS initiatives like CISA, uh, SRFSI, CEMIT, and ERI uh, are also working on this aspect. And a uh, few of the universities like AFU and uh, Tribune universities are also um, uh, have their postgraduate teaching and research program on conservation agriculture. So far as the area under conservation agriculture is concerned, about 800 hectare of uh, uh, DSR, 500 hectare of zero till maize, and 1,000 hectare of uh, Gerotil wheat has been practiced so far in Nepal, and uh, uh, majority of the legumes uh, relate with uh, our intercropped wheat maize in the uh, mid, mid to high hills of Nepal, and it covers about 30% of the area. And mo uh, most of the legumes are relate or intercropped under no till condition. Some notable findings to date. Um, and uh, I, as we all know, that uh, cropping uh, system yields. Uh, we are at par, our superior over the conversation and agricultures in Nepal, and many results have uh, shown uh, the uh, significant uh, achievement in the field of soil organic matter, uh, build of moisture content retention, increase in vegetation rates and soil nutrient contents. And uh, so far as this benefit cost ratio is concerned, obviously zero till uh, uh, surpassed the uh, um, conventional TLS. Water efficiency was also increased from 15 to 50 percent uh, uh, under CA, and similarly, the greenhouse gas emission was also reduced uh, through the increased carbon sequestration. Mainly, uh, we have crisis on soil, ecosystem, climate, and weather. Uh, cost of production, natural resources, food security, livelihoods, and the many others. And for this intensive tillage based mindset of uh, among the people is also contributing. And uh, actually to date, we don't have enough data to uh, recall the area under conservation agriculture. And there is the knowledge gap among the stakeholders on conservation agriculture, inadequate scale neutral uh, equipment and machineries, inadequate knowledge intensive CA and RCT based package of practices. Weed infestation, changes in pest dynamics, government policies are not friendly with uh, conservation agriculture, 
uh, uh, increasing land fragmentation, poor market and storage infrastructures, inadequate research trusts on conservation agriculture, unfair custom duties to tax provision for conservation agriculture and RCT-based machinery spare parts. Some of the coordinated efforts, efforts uh, uh, need to be uh, done uh, to overcome the bottlenecks of, uh, for experimentation uh, sent to promotion of conservation agriculture. There uh, must be a change in commitment and behavior of all stakeholders, for farmers, social mechanism that encourage experimentation, learning and adaptation to local conditions are prerequisite. Policy makers should be uh, friendly with conservation agriculture and uh, some of the institutions like Department of Agriculture, Nepal Agriculture Research Council and its bodies across the countries and uh, different level of government institutions should be uh, um, in line with these uh, CA systems that requires the fully understand of its large economic, social and environmental benefits. Policy and institutional supports that provides both incentives, that is mostly in motivation factor as well as uh, incentive factors needs to be done in place to promote the CA. Some technological, socioeconomical and policy bottlenecks for its adoption need to be explored. Uh, holistic paradigms should be there, linkage with uh, CGS systems, linkage with RD institutions, strengthening countries specific CA networks, conservation uh, agriculture and system intensification that has been already operated uh, in Nepal since 1919 uh, in collaboration with uh, government of India, government of Pakistan, government of Bangladesh and government of Nepal. And uh, some of the glimpse of SRFSI and some of the glimpse of uh, Simit Sisa uh, under rice wheat cropping systems in Nepal. Some recommendations I have made over here, innovation platforms model for promotion of technology, develop champions, farmers and institutions, uh, organize farmers in group, formula and informal, uh, based on the experience of uh, um, international communities, leverage on ICTs in research, education, extension system must be there. Uh, policies must be CA friendly, friendly and a strong partnership must be there, strengthening farmers and community level capacity and uh, strengthening local level service providers. That is the basic for the promotion of uh, conservation agriculture practices, regular workshops and meetings uh, for the coordination as well as linkages and uh, partnership with agri-food uh, system in uh, commodities, uh, partnership with different uh, UN and uh, you know, institutional level or country level or regional level uh, initiatives like SCAF, SAM, BISA, ICAF, SCT, networks, etc. And uh, at the end, the most important uh, presentation of my um, uh, delivery is the experimentation and promotion of CA that is working model for uh, Nepal. Uh, for the entire process of research, redone, experimentation, verification, evaluation, and promotion. These are the five major steps to be followed. And uh, for this, uh, there are uh, different venues are to be uh, selected and uh, different venues are to be utilized. Research design is uh, for mainly for problem identification, prioritization, and design. And it is um, mainly uh, done by CGR centers, NARC, education extension, local government, provincial government, federal, NGOs, farmers, and private sector. Similarly, for the experimentation, it must be uh, on, uh, mainly on honest test and followed by unfarm. And for this, NARC should take the lead in Nepal and education, NGOs, farmers, and service provider, extension, pro, pro, uh, private sector, CG, CGR centers. And uh, for verification purpose, that is for widely uh, uh, demonstration that is on farm demonstration in the farmers field need to be led by extension, NARG, NGOs, farmers, private sectors, CGR centers, and for evaluation, the uh, on station as well as on farm experiment and uh, uh, verification trials need to be done by all the stakeholders as mentioned below. For the promotion, that this is the critical uh, step for the um, uh, CA. Uh, 
and it is mainly done in on farm and for this actions should take the lead followed by ngos farmers government apo private sector donor financial institution and insurance companies working across the country and uh, to sum up uh, the policy institutions funding institution research extension education and private institution must be in place uh, for the uh, strong participation for to um, wider adoption of conservation agriculture and for this entire process of experimentation to promotion we need uh, uh, we need the strong participation of all the stakeholders and uh, with the steps provided with the increase in the steps the increase in level of participation must be there and the participation must be viable and functional uh, in terms of its uh, delivery so with this i think i want to congrat i want to thank uh, thank the organizing committee of eighth world congress on conservation agriculture for, for providing me such an opportunity to be with you the uh, entire ca families across the globe with this thank you very much and uh, namaste goodbye just now tika talk about the experience initiative and notable findings of ca in nepal uh, he also talked about the ex experimentation and the promotion of ca proposed model uh, for nepal thank you uh, kaki um, the first speech is from ug nido he is from fao regional office for Asia and uh, the Pacific. Uh, please show his uh, video. Today, I'd like to present conservation of the project, a study in the West. Smallest is located in the southeastern part of Southeast Asia. The country is dominated by sloping lands. And the farming practices mainly the slush and burn shift and plow systems. The farmers in general having less knowledge on agriculture and modern agriculture practices. In Timor-Leste, poor soil fertility and land degradation contribute low, pro low crop productivity compounded by changing climate and increased disaster risk largely the drought caused by the El Niños. To address these issues, the conservation agriculture in Timor Leste started in 2013 to enhance household food and nutrition security and improve rural livelihood through more sustainable agricultural practices. The project in different phases, fortunately, with the different donors, the project is still continuing. The project had the three main pillars. The first one is to validating conservation agriculture practice, and then it's demonstrated. The second pillar is adaptation of conservation agriculture through the, the community-based participatory extension approach in general, we call a farm of schools. The third pillar is enabling, creating enabling environment for the conservation agriculture, which mainly support the development of a policy strategy and the processes. Conservation agriculture practices introduced in Timor Leste targeted to measure crops of maize, cassava, mung beans, soybeans, and the cover crops used to uh, cowpea, lima beans, lapla, pigeon pea, berber bean, or mokuna, wing bean, and cespania. The tools and the machineries introduced are uh, shown below for replacing traditional planting sticks different types of uh, direct seeders, including jab planters, 
the tractor and then the two-wheel tractor mounted direct seeders and then the, the residue management the knife roller were introduced. The results of this, the conservation agriculture introduced in Timor Leste is the main impact was the yield. In general, yield increased from 30% to 150%. In 2015, 2016 was a drought year by the El Nino. But as you can see from this table, the conservation agriculture yield was double, almost double the uh, non adapters or traditional practices. The contribution of a yield coming from a drought tolerance. This figure shows that the uh, response of a uh, drought tolerance compared with the traditional systems, although the result varies from, from a site to sites, but the significant Dollar tolerance was, in, was shown in this results. So the main benefits of uh, the yield increase was from uh, improvement of uh, so physical property. This is the result of uh, uh, infiltration in the bulk density analysis. So chemical property improvement was not significant with a uh, relatively short period of, uh, of adaptations. With this increased productivities, the food security was secure, uh, very improved from a 30% to almost 70% of the food securities. The conservation agriculture benefited not only the yield, but also the lots of savings, including labels. The, the overall time saving or labor savings being observed throughout these different all these tasks, but the planting and weeding labor savings was very significant. We don't save times and labels, how the farmers spend the, the save time. Showing this is about half of them is spent for the resting and then the other extra time spent for the vegetable gardening and then the other the, the uh, house, household uh, economic improvement including processing and the selling uh, agricultural produce. It's not only the labels being saved but the, also the, the fuel was significantly saved. So not only the socioeconomic uh, uh, benefits contributed by the conservation agriculture, but also the, the contributed to the, the, the improvement of a woman's uh, engagement and decision-making status in the agricultural community, uh, the uh, households. Although initial response is very positive, but we still have a lot of uh, gaps and challenges. For example, like sustainable mechanizations with the different uh, scales and particularly this, the small scale farmers in the, with, on the swapping lands needs to be uh, developed. And we still are uh, lacking with a suitable uh, cover crops with uh, more uh, biomass productions and the, the different suitability for different agroclimatic zones. We also need to strengthen all our supply chains and in the service providers. Now, of course, we need to continue uh, improving uh, policy support and awareness support to sustain these benefits of con conservation agriculture brought into Timor Leste.
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yuji introduced the application process and effectiveness of uh, conventional agriculture in Southeast uh, Asia. And the conventional agriculture has achieved uh, remarkable results in improving crop yields, emergency rates, and uh, drought uh, residence. Uh, thank you, Yuji. I hope uh, FLIP can give more support to CA in Asia. The fifth speech is by Bill Krabber-Krabber. Uh, Bill, your time is also 10 minutes, please. Great, am I on? Is my slide there? Can you put my slide up, please? Uh, that's not mine. <laughs> I'm the only one live. It's going to make it more challenging, is it? Ah, oh, there we go. Right, Arise African Agriculture. Greetings everyone all around the world, wherever you are. Um, I'm uh, from Western Australia and I farmed there for 13 years and I was a scientist that led the no-till revolution uh, across Western Australia and then led um, elsewhere. And I've now retired from farming at the age of 60 and consulting in Western Australia. And now I am um, working in agriculture to see in Africa to see if I can improve food security. Uh, there, most people over here are, are doing small farmer um, farmer technologies, and uh, they're not uh, getting into no tillage very much. There are some good people that are doing that, including Foundations for Farming in Zimbabwe, and um, a couple of other groups that you would be aware of that are networked well with the. Um, the Global Conservation Ag Group. So we have a, a problem with um, uh, lack of technology being adopted and lack of no tillage in Africa. And um, if I can just forward this, um, how do we forward this? Can you forward it, moderator, please? Right, so one of the technologies that's missing in Africa is uh, biotechnology. It has huge potential. Um, to solve the problem. Uh, these photos I took, I took them recently um, in Uganda, but you can find them also in uh, all the countries in Africa. And there's plenty of land that's available for good agriculture in Africa that hasn't um, been used or it's being used, but very inefficiently with slash and burn, then move on after two years. Um, it's a very organic approach to agriculture here, which is not replacing the nutrients that are required. China tried that technology in the 70s and 60s, I believe, with the Cultural Revolution and um, people starved and were eating the bark off the tree. And uh, the similar thing is happening here in Africa. People are starving and they're using organic technologies. There's just not enough fertilizer in the manure of animals. Um, so people are, um, um, are missing out. So if we had access to BT and RR technology, they're Roundup Ready, which is um, GMOs for those that don't know, um, then it would remove the need for applying pesticides, insecticides for um, control of armyworm. And if we had Roundup Ready technology, then the weeds wouldn't have to be um, cultivated all the time. Um, certainly there are the herbicides that do exist, but they're very minimal and they're expensive and they're they're less environmentally friendly than glyphosate or Roundup. So if we had those two technologies, no-till, I believe, would flourish very quickly here in Africa and the soil health would improve, crop yield, yields would at least quadruple, um, food security would, um, would rise and farming would become enjoyable and profitable and people would have something to sell. If we go on to the next one, please. Next slide. Where's the moderator? There we go. Um, so other tools are also needed. Um, uh, access uh, to affordable lime. Often the soils, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I'm based, the pH of the soil is typically around in the low fours. Sometimes in Burundi, it's in the high threes. This is in calcium chloride measure. Most of the measurements are actually measured in water and people don't realise that that's very different to calcium chloride. And calcium chloride is a more honest reflection of the value of the pH or the level of aluminium in the soil. I think in Africa, because of the extra rains that we get in this subtropical area, 
the uh, or tropical area, the the acidity is buffered a little bit against, but I, by the water co continually coming in. But I'd imagine that if um, if liming was done properly and the pH was lifted above five or five and a half or six uh, in calcium chloride, that um, uh, production would would double just from that angle. And then everything else you do becomes valuable after that because you get reward for your effort. So. Um, you know, one of the difficulties is in Africa is lime is often uh, sold for making houses and it's not sold as an agricultural commodity and it needs to be affordable and governments need to make policies to make it affordable because it's uh, the livelihood of um, the people's depends on the soil pH being um, ameliorated. And they, they, they don't see the soil acidity issue. It's something that's not obvious. It doesn't stick out at you. Um, it's a subtle thing, but it's crippling the yields. Um, another problem in Burundi I've come across is that they, um, there's a government policy to only have organic um, phosphorus fertilisers and that comes at six times the price tag of DAP. So that's crippling the ability for them to grow good crops. Um, scale can be achieved, I believe, across Africa through co-ops and uh, the African Development Bank are backing the rise African agriculture to start projects with scaling up. So the big picture is that we go to a region, we work with the community, the community embraces um, the, um, the model that we, we're proposing, which we think is for the community. And, um, and at the end of three or four or five years, um, I as the CEO will move away from those community farms that are larger in area and everyone has a share and people uh, can see the rise and the improvement in the production. Typically one tonne per hectare is common in corn or maize in Africa, and it should be six to 12 tonnes per hectare. And I think six can be achieved quite quickly by switching to no-till liming, applying N and P and using um, good varieties. They don't have to be biotech varieties, but if they were, that would um, lift the production probably another 20, 30% and make things a lot easier. Finance is problematic. So what we've got is a springboard model where, where we'll, we'll um, invite people um, you know, we'll have these cooperatives. The plan is to have five cooperatives um, and, and they'll be big farms and people have ownership of them. And then from those five farms, we'll, each farm will sponsor another farm here and another farm here and another farm there once they're successful. And that's in the Rise African Agriculture model, which you can see on the Rise African Agriculture website. Uh, small tractors are possible, um, um, but on larger areas, larger tractors would be needed. Uh, we need sound knowledge of chemistry and biochemistry. Often in Africa, people believe that chemicals are evil. They don't realise that water's a chemical and they know that petrol's a chemical, but they don't drink petrol. <clears throat> but there's this view, even by doctors here in Africa, it's, it surprises me, the, the penetration of fear in Africa for chemicals. And so I have to try and work, work people through, and it's not very hard because I say you don't drink petrol and don't put uh, water in your car and water is dihydrogen oxide, it's a chemical. So with this, some of these, you know, quite logical um, uh, comments, I'm, I'm gaining traction and um, and that's very important. And I think it'd be nice if the rest of the uh, global community on CA could really add some shoulder to the wheel of pushing back on chemicals because people are being scared and the city people are now trying, wanting to tell us how to farm and that's quite dangerous because they don't know how to farm. And if they came out here in Africa and started doing organic farming, I guarantee you, just like the Belgians did here in uh, DRC in 1905, they went hungry. In fact, they couldn't produce as good a crop as the local Africans because the local Africans knew that to, um, to fix up some of their problems in the soil, they need to slash and burn. When they slashed and burnt, they released potassium, they released lime, they released molybdenum, and those, and then and then legumes grew after that, and then after that, then they could grow a crop. The native legumes grew. There's a system that's been put in place in this beautiful world we live in. So, so this technology is available. It's um, um, but it has, but it ha we have to have all the tools of the toolbox. And um, the, the local people 100 years ago knew this, and and yet now it's not known um, the importance of lime, importance of phosphorus, the importance of potassium and molybdenum, etc. Um, we've got smart other tools. You know, we've got smart cars, smartphones. We need smart. We need smart um, uh, farms. So all the tools. Next slide, please. 
So Africa has a right to food security and energy security. At the top of this list, Tom Goddard said the best land is used up. Well, Tom, my good friend, that's not true. <laughs> if you're not thinking of Africa, OK, but if you're thinking of Africa, there's lots of good savanna land here that's ready and available, has been slashed and burned and hasn't been used properly, but it's good soil apart from the pH and phosphorus and other nutrition issues, which we can fix. You know, the world is um, heading down a path of veganism and climate change alarmism, uh, NGOism. It's, it becomes a business and makes money and doesn't it teach, it gives people a fish, but doesn't teach them how to fish. Well, I'm over here to help them make a fishing rod and a sinker and, um, and, and, the, and the twine as well to throw it out with. So um, there's also the organic, um, I'd, I'd call it a cult because it's just not logical. You can't, it's very, it becomes like a belief and it's very difficult to, and it makes people, you know, steals from people, it kills people and destroys people. Um, you're just not producing one ton of corn is not making anybody money. Um, traditional, oh, I've said slash and burn technology, uh, it's inefficient, it's terrible, and it's got no ownership of the land, you just move on. So there's no, there's no ownership in improving your land. And we know that this technique includes uh, tillage and it destroys the soil in the long term. That's why they have to move on, especially in the warm tropics and Brazil's like that. Um, I think it looks like I've got a minute left. Intensive large rains in loamy sands, uh, sorry, in loamy soils cause catastrophic erosion. Um, chemicals are tools to be used safely with knowledge and governments need policy that empower farming. I think I've got my last slide, which is a summary. Thank you. Africa has no choice but to embrace smart farming or no-till farming, and I believe biotech as well. Uh, 1.2 billion people will soon become doubled. Food security will reduce population growth because once they've got food, they don't have the need to produce so many children to protect the parents in their old age. So it actually, you know, we can, it's a win-win here. Prosperity will follow with structural improvements. Forests and paths can be protected. They don't need to go in there and slash and burn them. They can leave them, protect them, build up the wildlife. So it's good for ecosystems. Um, and there is a need, I think, for lower taxes with commercial farms because at the moment that's one incentive that's um, making it very difficult for people to invest in these countries. Thank you for your time and I hope you got something out of this presentation. Feel free to go and look at the Arise African Agriculture website and thank you to the um, my global no-till farmer friends. Um, really appreciate you being in this space. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we know that uh Western Australia did very conventional agriculture. Bill just now introduced the, the status and the issues of uh, Africa food, summarized and proposed a new approach. He also talked about the, some challenges, the future development of CA in Africa. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Now, let's invite uh, um, Gott Leiberg, uh, Pastor, to give his speech. Before he can, uh, give the speech, I would like to say thanks to God Leiber and his team for organizing this very um, excellent uh, 18th WCCA. Please. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, uh, well, that, uh, well, it's not only me, it's, as you said, it's uh, the whole team that made this possible. Okay, now to my talk. Hello uh, to all and thank you for joining this session. My name is Gottlieb Pasch and I'm the chair of the European Conservation Agriculture Federation, but also professor at the University of Evora in Portugal and researcher at the Mediterranean Institute for Agriculture, Environment and Development. With my brief intervention, I want to shed some light on the core objectives of the uh, European Common Agriculture Policy, also named a CAP and the potential of conservation agriculture to sustainably achieve most of them. I even would dare to say that the CA is the only way to achieve the main targets in an efficient, concomitant and cost-effective way. Briefly, since its foundation uh, until the end of the last century, the CAP had, broadly speaking, these four main objectives. Provision of food, increase of productivity, income support to the farming sector, affordable food and market regulation. Only at the dawn of this century, following intensification and overproduction, other objectives partially replaced the old ones and more attention was given to rural development, 
to the competitiveness of the farming sector, anticipating the reduction of prices at the consumer, uh, sorry, at the producer, environment and biodiversity with focus on resources, on the resources of water and later on soil and biodiversity, introducing minimum standards, also known as conditionality, to continue and justify the strong income support to f European farmers. All this translated and translates into the following approaches followed in the past and today. The so-called cross-compliance, asking the member states for establishing minimum standards to guarantee the good and uh, agriculture and environmental conditions. The setting up of, by each member state of agri-environmental measures to go beyond the minimum standards. Greening measures, to set the stake a bit higher for mandatory compliance, the establishment of eco-schemes by the member states to boost sustainable practices such as precision farming, agroecological approaches, including organic uh, and carbon farming. The revision of the sustainable use of pesticide directive, an integrated nutrient and management plan action, the proclamation of ensuring food security, and here you see uh, some question marks, I will come back to this later, and the setting up of a mission area called Soil, Health and Food. Thus, the hotspots of, today, uh, con uh, of the today's uh, common agriculture policy can be summarized as follows. Climate action, including mitigation and adaptation, preserva uh, preservation of the natural resource base, and uh, also to contribute to the protection of biodiversity, habitats and uh, landscapes and the delivery of ecosystem services. To achieve all this, the CAP announced recently several core strategies to be streamlined in the next programming period from 21 to 27. One of them is uh, the well-known uh, European Green Deal with the efficient use, focusing on the efficient use of resources, the transition towards clean and uh, circular economy, uh, pollution reduction and biodiversity restoration, and here it comes, zero pollution target, which means the transformation of 20%, 25% of the utilized agriculture area under, uh, under organic farming by 2030. And here actually there is a clash, a clear clash with the objective of uh, food security. Investment in uh, environmental friendly technologies. Then the farm to fork strategy, focusing on climate action, both mitigation and adaptation healthy, affordable and sustainable food, protecting environment and biodiversity. Then the already mentioned European mission on soil health, uh, which means caring for soil is caring for life, meaning that they want uh, to have 75% of uh, European uh, cropland healthy uh, with healthy soils by 2030. And after all, a biodiversity strategy that establishes protected areas, at least 30% of land and sea areas, uh, and recovering degraded ecosystems on land and sea. Now, the question is actually how to serve and to deliver the ingredients to achieve all this, and simultaneously. How, or sh how should or could the menu look like? I guess we all know the menu or the manual uh, to successfully re reach these goals. To start with, we must avoid soil disturbance at the most using implements allowing for that. Second, we need a main course full of crop residues and cover crops, as you can see here, followed by a dessert of a great variety of crops, either mixed or in rotation. And in terms of drinks, we only need to guarantee that the water can infiltrate be retained as much as possible and be protected against unproductive loss through evaporation. All this you can see and you can achieve through a well-covered soil surface, as you can see in this slide, showing a much higher uh, infiltration rates under no-till and soil cover, lower evaporation losses, the higher the percentage of soil cover, and 
the water depleted soil profile under conventional soil management. And this uh, photo to the left is not a photomontage. It's actually the border, uh, right at the border between uh, conservation agriculture with a thick soil cover and the normal conventional tillage. All this together is actually the precondition for a wealth of good company within the soil, all contributing to its health, well-functioning and the delivery of the manifold ecosystem services we expect a soil to provide. Now, knowing that uh, the principles of conservation agriculture, uh, that, that the principles of conservation agriculture contain all the ingredients to satisfy most of the requests and demands of the common agriculture policy, what then is still needed to have this menu chosen? I think one important step would certainly be to improve soil uh, the literacy about soils and soil health and the perception about true and holistic sustainability. All this applies to consumers, the civil society as a whole, as well as to farmers. Sustainability must be perceived not as an ultimate goal to reach, but as the best possible compromise between conflicting objectives. We need also to make European and national decision makers understand that the core CAP objectives cannot be achieved with half-hearted ha half measures. For example, two of the greening measures, crop diversity and the ecological focus area of 5%, were not at all effective with regard to the aims of uh, these measures we're supposed to achieve. What, uh, what would obliging to grow two or three crops on a farm contribute to whatever goal when monocropping is still possible? And why promoting biodiversity and carbon sequestration on only 5% of the farms, farmland if applying CA principles would allow the same on 100% of the cropland? Still today, the lion's share of the common agriculture policy budget is spent through direct payments to the farming sector based on previous entitlements without a clear link to the achievement of verifiable goals set in the CAP such as avoiding soil erosion, soil organic matter or biodiversity decline, or other threats to the delivery of ecosystem services. We also need to make consumers, the civil society and decision makers understand that productive agriculture must be able to trust on the availability of safe inputs that have to, have to and will be used responsibly. Rational, science-based and responsible use is a must for all external inputs in agriculture. But the crusade against and the rejection of chemical or synthetic modern inputs does not make agriculture per se sustainable. And in Europe, an unbiased objective appreciation of all pros and cons of the different farming approaches is des desperately needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl uh, Leiber. Just now, just now, Carl Leiber introduced the role of conservation agriculture in Europe, uh, Europe Common Agriculture Policy in details. Compared the application of conservation agriculture to a menu, he also gives some suggestions to get the menu. Thank you. The last, the, the seventh speech is uh, by Rock. He is a professor at the University of uh, Ljubljana. Yeah, uh, um, hello, I'm Dear here. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to present you our proposal of conservation agriculture as a standalone action within Slovenian Rural Development Plan beyond uh, 2021. Uh, it was done by Slovenian Association for Conservation Agriculture. Um, Slovenia, as you can see, is a small country in the middle of Europe. It's about half the size of a Switzerland. It's in a developed part of the world, but still uh, only 1% of arable land is done uh, according to conservation agriculture principles. And uh, we really want to improve this uh, because we need to keep the soil in a good condition. 
so our goal is with the proper action uh, that we can go up to 25% of total arable land in the five years. Uh, and this is quite realistic, we think. Uh, but of course, we need to have a political support for this. And uh, we would like to see independent, voluntary, but long-term measure. And uh, the farmers would uh, have to be engaged fully so that the administration burden should not be too high. And uh, the farmers should be free and creative to do this because uh, the new knowledges are now appearing from day to day and uh, the, uh, the knowledge is spread from farmer to farmer. So we need creativity and freedom. But of course, we have to follow uh, mandatory uh, targets. Uh, so each uh, farmer who would enter the system would have to follow and prepare action plan for five years. And uh, the farmer would have to do conservation agriculture permanently on the same field, not one year on, on one and the other year on another. Uh, and we, uh, the farmer would have to keep a diary of operations uh, so that he would be transparent uh, to the audience. Our goal is, of course, to keep the organic matter in the soil or to improve the content when needed. Uh, for that, uh, we need soil analysis at the start and after five years. And with the reduced tillage, we believe we are, we are going to get higher soil organic carbon in the upper 10 centimeters but not just because of the reduced tillage, uh, the farmer would have to make a fertilization plan for five years. And uh, within fertilization plan also, uh, there are calculators of humus balance uh, and the balance must show a positive or, or neutral uh, state. And also the nutrients must be used properly so that nitrogen use efficiency, for example, must be higher than 50% up to 90 percent uh, so really to to use less uh, mineral fertilizers as well um, and uh, uh, of course we have to reduce the intensity of tillage uh, to keep the soil and uh, not to damage uh, the, the soil ecosystem so we would be preferentially on the, on the top 10 centimeters of working depth uh, when it is needed to go deeper, uh, the soil surface must not be, not, must not be damaged, uh, so at least 25% of surface area uh, at, at, mass, at most uh, should be intervened. And uh, working uh, element uh, should not go wider than 15 centimeters of the soil surface up to 20, uh, it is possible uh, that, that we can have then strip tillage, for example. Uh, we are developing with uh, a company, Refarma from Austria, a simple uh, tool for farmers to see uh, the coverage of uh, by, by smartphones, uh, geolocated pictures, put it into the diary log, so that the farmers are controlling themselves uh, what are doing and that the administrative control is not so needed. And of course, we have to improve the biodiversity of agroecosystem. This is one of the goals of conservation agriculture. And in five years, at least three agricultural species of at least three different botanical fam families must be in a given field and uh, to be seen as a crop in a crop rotation, we would need uh, the crop at, for at least 60 days on a field. Uh, we are uh, want to have mixed crops as well uh, of two or more species of two different botanical families. And of course, we can have permanent crops also in fields, but not more than three years uh, continuously out of five years. And still in these five years, we need at least three agricultural species of uh, different botanic, botanical families. And at least once every five years, a legume must be in a crop rotation. So 
uh, with a lot of negotiations and talking to the audience, we are now in the official strategic plan uh, for agricultural policy development uh, from 2023 to 2027. Uh, it's still a draft document, it's still negotiation, and uh, we will see what will happen. Uh, for example, organic farming are opposing conservation agriculture because they are maybe losing grounds. And uh, the audience uh, and the policy acknowledge two strategic goals of conservation agriculture, to contribute to climate change mitigation and to climate adaptation to create change adaptation and to sustainable energy use and uh, to promote sustainable development and efficient management of natural resources, soil, water, air. And if we stay inside uh, this uh, official program, uh, the farmers would get investment support uh, to get new machines uh, which are needed, but uh, specifically uh, the investment support is going to be given uh, to um, drilling planting technology. This is the most uh, lacking part. And another thing which is important, in especially in Europe, which is fighting against herbicides, we are going to need new uh, non-chemical weed control machinery and technology. And uh, of course, uh, a support is needed at uh, the start after maybe uh, the farmers would uh, be able to do without some financial support. Uh, but at the beginning, we assume around uh, for Slovenia, around 800 euros for orchards, vineyards are needed for arable things, the fields around 600 euros per hectare. And also grassland can get uh, support if done properly. So uh, thank you very much for this short overview of what we are doing in Slovenia in political terms. At uh, now we are successful. We started in December 25. Uh, uh, we are young and we are growing fast and uh, I think it's a great future in ahead of us, but we have to struggle. Thank you. Just now, uh, Mr. Rock introduced uh, Slova uh, Slovenia's post-2021 uh, Rural Development Plan for Conservation Agriculture. Uh, thank you, Rock. Thanks to all seven speakers for your ex excellent speech and timekeeping. Now, let's move to questions and answers. The first one, The first question is to Yash. Uh, obstacles encountered in the promotion of conservation agriculture, such as how to reduce high cost input. Yeah, okay, so um, I, I'll take that question for Yash. Um, I'm here for Yash today. Um, I guess that's a great question. I guess there's probably really a role for government um, initially in bringing down input costs for farmers, um, and particularly um, during the adoption stages. Um, so things like subsidising inputs or providing credit for farmers um, who have low levels of liquidity to um, enable them to purchase the inputs they require. Um, and I guess also uh, fostering partnerships between the private sector and producers. Um, so uh, we can try and achieve some of those economies of scale um, to, you know, in terms of seeding equipment and fertiliser um, supplies and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, thank you. The second question, uh, Kotlaiba, are you here? Yes. Yeah, the second question is to you. Uh, somebody want to know how uh, to know if uh, if possible that conservation agriculture develop rapidly in Europe in the next uh, five years? Well, uh, rapidly is a rather relative term, I would say. Uh, so, rapidly, I think if I think uh, there is some chance to uh, to increase, to expand, 
uh, rapidly. I uh, don't expect that it's uh, at a at a rate of uh, 10 or 15 percent a year. Uh, but I think if we had uh, by well in the next five years, if you reached from the now uh, four million hectares uh, in the EU uh, up to six to seven or eight even uh, million hectares, that would be a great success. And I think it depends very much on the on the decisions that are taken by the by the decision makers uh, to embrace CA as the true uh, sustainable approach. And as I mentioned in my conclusions, what is needed to uh, promote CA in Europe, it's uh, the perception of of uh, true sustainability. It's not only uh, well, uh, leaving leaving or zero pollution and uh, to reduce the inputs of uh, synthetic uh, inputs, it uh, needs an overall approach, uh, balancing uh, the inputs and uh, the benefits and the pros and cons, and to uh, arrive at a at a well this best compromise. I would say, if we are able to do that, I think. We can we can reach uh, six, seven, or even eight million hectares within five years. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, few. Yep. The question to you: How mm -hmm. can Australian conservation agriculture te uh, techniques be applied in Africa? Oh, very easily. Just bring them on over and make it happen. Just make sure the tools are available. Um, you know the it, it's got to be the governments have got to be supportive of technology there's a lot of fear of chemicals and i think we're hearing that in europe and that's reverberating here in africa and if they cut off the chemicals well then they'll stay organic farming and they'll stay producing one ton per hectare but if they can allow and empower and i think this would be my appeal to all of you people that are there is push back don't just give in don't just say we're going to have to go and rock. I respect what you said, but um, you said made the comment that we're going to need non-chemical weed controller. I think that's true, but let's not make that our focus. Uh, it can be in the background, but I think our number one focus should be defending chemicals because our body is full of chemicals. Um, and that's the biggest problem in Africa. It's an organic experiment and it's failing and people are starving. This is where everyone's starving. And the rest of the world has used chemicals. You know, we put petrol in our car and now we're being told we can't do that either. <laughs> Where's it going to end? There's got to be some um, some logical discussion about this and it's got to happen at high levels. And, it's, and a, you, what Europe does affects what happens here in Africa because there's an umbilical cord between here and Europe. And Europe, um, Europe's illogical um, bullying uh, NGO attitude is doing a lot of damage uh, to Africa. And, and this will be marked down in 10, 20, 30 years time as a crime against humanity. These people are starving and they need these tools. If, if Africa had the tools that Australia has, there'd be no starvation in Africa. And maybe that's what people want Africa to be poor so that they can use them in some little weird game. I don't know. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Godleiber, another question to you. How do Europe regular, uh, regulate react to having conflicts that you have mentioned between different girls? Do they acknowledge them? Are they working to iron them out? The different goals, well, uh, you see, I always say, or one says, Paper is very patient. You can write a lot uh, on on paper, you, whatever you want. But uh, the question is how to put in practice, how to concomitantly achieve different goals. And they are all, often conflicting goals. And this nobody wants to see that goals are conflicting. And we have to achieve a compromise. And this is actually uh, missing uh, at the decision maker, at the policy uh, stage. They just want to sell uh, objective and to defend objectives that are uh, well well seen in the in the broad public because the broad public unfortunately uh, is not very well informed. There is a lot of disinformation, 
and that's why uh, things are are biased, really biased uh, in terms of decision making uh, and uh, well achieving or trying to achieve uh, some goals uh, more strongly than others and others are left behind. What about to ensure productivity and production? How, how if we want to uh, uh, put 25% of European cropland under, under organic farming? I have nothing against organic farming, but we all know that we cannot achieve the yields we have now with organic farming, so far at least. And well, how will Europe manage to uh, well to get all the stuff it needs? We know we can import wherever we want and from wherever we, we want. Nobody is questioning uh, what uh, GMOs are used elsewhere uh, and from where we import. So it's so uh, well. Uh, sometimes I even call it hypocrite uh, the attitude that uh, many many people and decision makers have. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Rock, two questions to you. The first one is what's the attitude of farmers and governments towards conservation agriculture in your country? Mm. Yeah, uh, farmers are uh, more and more in uh, the thing. Um, and uh, this is due to the leading farmers to the champion farmers in some regions. Uh, they, they see that uh, the way they were doing until now, it's not the way uh, to go further on, especially the younger farmers uh, want to go further uh, with new technologies and with uh, uh, there is an idea how to preserve the soil in good condition for further farming. Uh, because, you know, we are farming on the same land for thousand years in Europe now, and uh, it's really important that we continue on the same land. Uh, so uh, the, the awareness is raised and uh, as other people uh, said here, uh, Bill, for example, uh, we know that uh, organic farming even in Europe is uh, in practice in Slovenia, for example, I know uh, the practice uh, is giving uh, low yields. Uh, even in, in Slovenia, we have now two tons of wheat in uh, organics and uh, seven, eight tons in uh, conventional. So it's, it's really uh, they are mining the soil. Uh, uh, they, they are not putting nutrients and they are mining their own uh, basis. And uh, the farmers who went to schools, the young farmers see that. Uh, so it is a support, but we still uh, need a new knowledge uh, that's lacking. Uh, so we are in the beginning of the process. Yes, thank you. Uh, the question also to Rob, how much uh, is the uh, Slovenian government paying for other systems like uh, organic? Do yeah. you yeah, think it's uh, feasible your proposal? Yeah, uh, it was built up upon uh, this uh, present uh, scheme. So uh, uh, our proposal is that uh, the farmers, uh, it's a system approach. So within this system of uh, conservation agriculture, uh, all the measures which were uh, previously spread into various uh, schemes uh, uh, are now combined. Um, and uh, that's why we think it's uh, an adequate approach so that we are uh, competitive to uh, single uh, payment schemes uh, in one uh, uh, system approach like uh, conservation agriculture. And so yeah, our, our uh, uh, aim is to, to get uh, farmers paid enough to be motivated to, to go into the system approach, not to separate measures. A question from South Africa to Yash. The question is that I read, uh, I read that uh, a proxy made uh, 90 percentage of Western Australian farmers have adopted a no-till farming systems. How did you accomplish this? Yeah, well, Bill, did you want to take that one? 
thin as you were. <laughs> <laughs> you were yeah. on the ground there at the time. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, it was a very exciting time in the 1990s. We pushed back against uh, misinformation, which is where we're at again now because they said no tillage doesn't work and we pushed and we got a team together. It was a team of farmers and I was a young graduate from university in mid eighties and we got together and put the science and the farmers together and we just argued and argued and we went out there in the political space. We wrote letters to the editor, we got on the radio, we pushed, we pushed, we pushed. And in the end, our push was so strong, it just, cr the opposition crumbled. In fact, the main people, there was usually one person in each state of Australia that was anti-no tillage and they were like a strong man. And so we had to argue with that strong man. It wasn't never a woman, it just happened to be that way in the 90s. Um, and we had, to, we had to pull him down with logic, with clear evidence and, um, and we won. And so now we're actually 90, mm -hmm. probably 99% no tillage adoption now. There's a little bit of renovation tillage done for, to solve specific problems. And that I think needs to be blessed because um, we do have problems that tillage is a tool that actually solves like land that's not level. You have to use tillage to do that and a couple of other issues that we have. So we never want to demonize tillage. Um, we never want to demonise organic farming, but we do want the truth to be out there and, and the truth will set people free to be pros prosperous and sustainable. And that's what's happened in Western Australia. And now, the first time in Western Australia, I've just finished farming, which is a bit sad for me, but the whole state is having a very good rainfall season and the 20 years of no-till history in their soil will produce, you watch the, you watch the newspaper articles in November, December this year. West Australia will produce 20 million tonnes, I believe, unless frost gets them, of, of grain, and they've never grown more than 16 million tonnes before. This will be the record year because of the history and the resilience and the improvement of the soil over the last 20 years, and most people have been doing no-till for 20 years now, and you'll see an amazing, amazing um, prosperity come out from Western Australia. I don't know if you want to add to that, Yash, any more. <laughs> Um, no, Sorry, no, Catherine. I think, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, no, I think that that sort of covers it. And across, across, um, pretty much across the country, no tills pretty much taken off. Um, I think, I think also it was a combination of innovative farmers demonstrating that the system was profitable and logistically feasible. Um, and those sort of farmers really led the way and encouraged other farmers to adopt um, as well. And then when you had um, things like fuel prices going up and pesticide uh, herbicide prices coming down, um, the sort of the innovation in the system was at a level where it sort of just took off because it became more profitable um, in, our, in our climate. So, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yep, thank uh, you. I think uh, this question is to Tom. Tom, the question is that uh, various uh, soil cover crops have been proved to have excellent results. However, farmers have been reluctant to incorporate uh, these strategies due to market issues. What role can markets play in enhancing crop rotation and cover crop? Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, like I said, it's that catch-22 between uh, markets and new crops. So if you're uh, starting new crops in an area, there has to be a, a vehicle in which you can sell that crop into access to the new markets or you have to create the new markets for it so uh, i think there's a, a definite role for government in there to uh work with the um either the supply chain uh to develop new markets uh prove that the, the markets are there uh possibly subsidize supply chain or or products uh until it reaches that new market so um and is there processing of that new commodity locally or is it exported as a raw commodity to uh, other places? Um, now we have uh, segregated 
uh, type channels for markets. Uh, those might be an opportunity to to use. I've known several farmers that have specialty crops that they've had to market themselves into uh, foreign markets, sort of uh, select markets. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say that there's one recommendation that kind of depends on the local circumstances, but uh, there is definitely a role for government there to, to help grow the markets. Tom, could you say what, what, how many farmers are adopting cover crops and what, what percentage benefit does it give them? Uh, globally, I'm, I don't know. I don't have a uh, number Canada. on cover crops. Just Canada. Just Canada. Canada, it's, uh, it's fairly low. Uh, in Western Canada and Central Canada, it's uh, increasing. There is government, uh, but yeah, it's probably only a few percent mm. at this point. It's the same um, in Western, Western Australia. Our environments don't suit cover crops, and the, the global mantra is we must have cover crops, and I think that's a risky mantra to be pushing too hard, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And but I think it's uh, like we've learned from from adoption no till and other CA practices is it's trialing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you you try these uh, uh, trials out. We've done that with uh, dedicated crops, biofuel crops, things like that. And just because they grow massively somewhere else doesn't mean they grow well here. Um, mm -hmm. They they are looking at cover crops in eastern Canada where they have a longer growing season on the prairies after the harvest we just don't have enough frost free period or moisture to get a cover crop to grow to any circumstance it's it's usually very short um, seedlings that come out of the ground and at that point it's it's um, futile I guess um, we're having improvements with uh, winter crops. So there's been some breeding developments and uh, winter hardiness on crops and things like that. But cover crops are hard. As we heard yesterday, I think, um, was it El Salvador? They were saying that cover crops was one of the, the big sellers in CA adoption there. So where it is, where, where you do have that season and that ability, um, that's a fairly quick win you know, for people. Yeah, I'd like, Lee, sorry, this is an important issue because I think it's critical in um, in Brazil. They just cannot do no-till without cover crops, just cannot. And I think Africa will be the same where the temperatures are the same. The, so you've got no freeze um, in the winter like you have and you've got no drought in summer like Australia has. Uh, or well, Queensland's a bit different, of course, but um, because it's tropical. But, but in this, you know, th these tough environments, um, you, you, these really humid and moist and active environments, I think you must have cover for the soil in these environments. And in other tough environments, I think they should be questioned and challenged and, and debated and in a friendly way. Yeah, I, I agree. There's there's tough environments. There's, like I say, a huge potential probably in a lot of Africa uh, where they have the, the moisture and the, the growing season to, to have a cover crop of some sort established. Uh, there's a, a ton of benefits, as we know, from cover crops, so we won't go into there. Europe, I think, also has a, a huge potential for cover crops. Especially in the centre, I would say. Yeah, centre east, in the south, in the Mediterranean, it's a bit questionable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the plat uh, platform, no more questions. Uh, I think all us, uh, of us can talk about conservation ecology or ask questions to each other. Bill? Yeah. So, sorry, was uh, that a question? Was that a question to me? No, no more questions <clears throat> on the platform. Okay, <laughs> too much fun. <laughs> well, I, I would actually say that uh, the first thing we need is to, uh, to guarantee that the soil is covered whether with, through a cover crop or through crop residues. And as it was said, there are harsh environments where uh, there is not enough moisture, where temperatures don't allow to, uh, to grow a cover crop. But then you must rely on the residues of your main crop to have the soil covered. This is the most important aspect, I would say. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill, you mentioned in Africa that uh, the issue of soil acidity and need of lime for that. Uh, yesterday, the expert from Yara 
fertilizers and said that they could could include lime in their fertilizers uh, to sort of negate the acidification of urea. Is is there any potential of that? I mean, that, you you need a lot more lime than you can put on a fertilizer pro, I think, to to correct your acidity. Yeah, I think that's a red herring. It, it sort of fits in with the organic philosophy. But, you know, you, every time you harvest a, a, t a ton of a crop, you're harvesting, I don't know, 50 kilograms of lime or something. And over 100 years or 200 years or 1,000 years, as Rock said, um, you know, you've, you've got um, – big depletions of it and with the, this environment of up to 2000 millimeters of rainfall in soil a bit sandy and certainly loamy and not much clay um, and the natural gen genetics of the soil being ferrosols that were already slightly acidic you've just got this you know th thousands of years of continuous uh, leaching and there's a legumes that grow naturally and of course they need to be here otherwise you can't grow anything else because you need a form of nitrogen so there's there's natural legumes that exist in these environments and when they get going of course they produce nitrates and the nitrates leach and they leave the hydrogen ions behind or they take the hydrogen ions with them i don't understand it completely but i know that in legumes continuous uh, affect acidity so no i think what we need here is bulk um, Tom, and, and the problem is that, um, you know, they sell lime for $120 a tonne to make um, cement out of, and you just can't afford to do that. You can't afford to put, you know, five tonne or four tonne per hectare of lime on at that price. And in Australia, I would buy it in American dollars about $5 or $6 per tonne. It cost me, you know, 10 American to get it to my farm and then two American to spread it. And so I can put 10 tonnes on for, for very little. Um, and I've done that on my farm and I've fixed my farm over 13 years of uh, acidity that I was fighting with. So it's, it, it needs to be government policy almost to say, okay, these lime mines for farms <laughs> need to be found, um, made no extortion of the cost. You want to do big bulk and it has to get out there quick. So is there a supply of lime in Africa then that is accessible and in Australia was it subsidized through a government sort of subsidy system? No, Australia got out of it. Didn't just let the commercial world deal with it and that's made it cheap because they compete with each other. I'm getting some feedback from them. You're hearing that? No, okay. So, um, so, but in Africa, um, it, every country is different, of course. Um, but generally, they, the governments don't realise the scientists do, the soil scientists do. But for some reason, they're not getting their knowledge into the policies level at the government. And I don't know how to break that. If I could, I would. And I'll certainly continue to add, um, you know, logic to this issue. But that's that's the number one issue. You've got to get your foundation right first. You get your pH right, okay, everything else you get a benefit from. I agree with you very much because uh, we need to build enough calcium in the soil to get good structure. And this is even more important maybe in uh, uh, no till uh, when we just built uh, uh, the organic matter that's not enough for structure we have to have calcium as well and up to it depends on the soil type and that's not in uh, in awareness even in soil scientists they don't think enough on, on about that mm, I, th I think the calcium is important but but i think the carbonate is probably more rock important because the carbonate in calcium carbonate the CO3 reacts with the hydrogen ion, so it gets rid of it. Mm. I, I yeah, we, yeah. yeah, please, Tom. I, I just think I think you brought up good points of, of communication and needing to get this information out to either the general public or the policy holders or the policy influencers and and get it out in some kind of um, compatible form, I guess, or consumable form. So, uh, you know, I don't, it's probably a combination of everything from sort of popular press to radio to um, however, you know, people will take it uh, to, to look at and likewise to bring up um, or shine the light on policies that are needed or policies that don't work. Uh, in terms of the European policy, I saw the USDA had done a modeling. Uh, exercise to look at the impact of the EU policy and uh, they came up they said that uh, yields would decrease uh, in the EU 
as well as uh, income and competitiveness in the world markets. They said that uh, food prices would increase globally, even if the EU only uh, implemented that policy. But then they looked at what happens if they influenced other countries to build that policy as well. And uh, the food prices went up dramatically at that point. They also did, could determine that an, an additional 185 million people uh, would become food insecure, mostly in Africa and Asia, because of, of implementation of that policy. So, uh, you know, that study came out a few months ago and they're redoing it now. But the Americans that had done it were talking to their colleagues in Europe, which didn't disagree with them on the impacts of that. So, again, getting that information out into the public venue is is helpful. Mm. Yeah, another, another idea I think could be helpful, and, and Gottlieb, you might be able to contribute here, because of over half of the countries in Africa being speaking French, that's their main language, and I don't speak French. It, it's difficult for me, of course, Tom, to communicate. You'd probably do a better job being from Canada. <laughs> so come and join me. You're welcome <laughs> anytime. <laughs> um, but, but the problem is um, the, the French no-till farmer's success, I would like to see that shouted. If you could do that, Gottlieb, through the European Conservation Ag, if you could shout their success of their no-till in French, then it would have an impact in Africa, and that would be very helpful. Uh, I think you're right, uh, Bill, and I think our, our uh, close cooperation to, with ACT could actually contribute to that. Well, I personally, I'm, uh, well, uh, I read and understand French rather well, but speaking is not uh, as good. Yeah, I could help with Portuguese in Mozambique and Angola, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now, uh, recently, we, we see actually uh, that CA is developing quite uh, rapidly in France. And uh, I think we should, we should get uh, our colleagues, uh, French colleagues and French-speaking uh, colleagues, uh, into this boat and, and uh, well, push forward to, with a with a with a collaboration uh, together with ACT, we do have AC, uh, ECAF does have a an agreement uh, with ACT, and through that I think uh, we could actually help. And ACT is actually also uh, trying to to get our expertise and our support to to push f things forward in Africa. Mm. Yeah, only one minute. Yeah, the time is uh, uh, is up. Thank you for your presentation and uh, your answers to the questions. See you. See you. Bye-bye to all. Good